are hungry. Every one of us is hungry. And it's hard to even sometimes put it into words or even really explain it, but every one of us has a hunger that is deep inside. So it's a deep-seated hunger. We hunger for fulfillment. We hunger to be satisfied. We hunger for awe. We all have this, this sense of emptiness that we just want filled. We're yearning for something. We're hungry. And somehow I knew this even when I was a child. Like I remember being little and, and I would think to myself, man, life will be so good when summer finally comes, when school year's over. Children, amen? Yes? <laughs> Parents might not say amen. Or, or I would think, life is going to finally be good when it's my birthday. Or when it's Christmas. Or as I got older, when I can finally drive. Or, or this, this dream that I had of someday there's going to be this beautiful woman who's going to actually like me and want to live with me the rest of her life. Like, I thought, nah, that's not possible. Like, how, how does that even happen? By the way, guys, that is a miracle. Like, <laughs> let's just say that up front, that it is miraculous that any woman would want to live every day with the same guy, like, her whole life. Like you, like who you, you know you, and she wants you. Praise God. That is miraculous. And I had this idea of someday that could actually happen for me, and then, and then life will be better. And, and then finally one day I will finish college or get out of seminary, and then life will be better. And it's like, can you relate to this? On life being this endless cycle of looking at what's next. When I finally launch this career, when this business finally makes more money, when I finally get that promotion, when I make just, just 10,000 more a year. That's, that's it. If I just made 10K more, life would be perfect. And we think there's just one more mile marker, if I can just get one more toy, because grown men have their toys. So do women. It's not just the guys. Let's just be honest. And just get one more, or if I can just get that better house in a better neighborhood, or if I can just get my 401k to this level, if I can, if I can just, if I can just, if I can just, if I, if only it's right there, I can almost get it. I can, I can reach it. And, and, and then and you, you realize, like King Solomon did, it's vanity. It's chasing after the wind. You're never going to catch it. You'll never get there. You will never accumulate enough stuff or have enough accomplishments. And so we need to have our soul satisfied beyond our accumulations or our accomplishments. We are made for more, and we just think that our life is like this puzzle, and there's just like this one missing piece. If I can just get this one piece, then my life will be complete, this picture-perfect existence. And the reality is that, that is just it's a lie from the pit of hell. Every one of us is hungry. We crave fulfillment, and whether you realize it or not, I don't know where you're at spiritually today, but whether you know it or not, whether you have cognitively acknowledged it or not, you are searching for something. You are hungry for something, and, and I'm here to tell you, if you didn't know, his name is Jesus. The bread of life that came down from heaven who alone can satisfy, as we just sung, Jesus is better. 
See, you were created by God to crave his glory. He made us, he wired us, like hardwired us against our will, God's will. He made us with a desire, with a will that craves him and his glory. And so he designed us to crave, to long for his presence, for himself. You were made by God and for God to worship him. And you worship him by enjoying him. And when you enjoy him and you are worshiping him, you are then glorifying him. These are all interconnected realities. That the very enjoyment of God is worship and is glorifying to him. So the fundamental human problem that all of us share is not that we deny God's existence. There are almost zero atheists in this world. Yes, there are secular humanists and there are agnostics and all kinds of different belief systems. But if you get down to actual atheists, there is no God. There are very, very few people that actually hold to that intellectually honest position. The, the problem with human beings is not so much that we deny God's existence. The, the problem with us is that we value ourselves more than we value God. This is the fundamental problem, is that we know he exists, but we don't treasure him. We don't value him. We value ourselves and our pursuits, and it's called idolatry. It's worshiping God. Enjoying loving something more than you love God, the real thing who only can satisfy. And so we can believe the lies of the enemy. We can believe the lies that Jesus is not enough, that God does not love you, that he's not there for you, that God's given up on you or God's forgotten you. These are all lies and sometimes they're very subtle, but we can believe them. And so we need to know who God is we need to know what God is like, and we need to learn how we can live our lives in light of the gospel of who we are in Christ so that we can live lives that are vibrant and full of joy and purpose in the presence of God, living for his glory. As we're continuing in our series in Revelation today, we're going to look at a church in Pergamum, a church that was believing the lie. So in Revelation 2, this third church in the circuit of these seven churches is a church that was compromised, a church that believed the lies and thus were not radiant. But I pray that this church, that renewed church, can be a radiant church, a church that is vibrant and therefore is radiating the glory of God, that we are reflecting and displaying his glory. So this is the message to the church of Pergamum. It's in Revelation 2, verses 12 through 17. Now, before we dig in, and we will, I want to give you a little bit of historical context. If you go to Turkey today and you go near the coast on the north, on the west side of the country, you will find Pergamum. And, and the ruins are still there. So even though Turkey is a Muslim country, if you, if you go there today, you'll see all the Greek ruins of what once a very large, thriving city. In its day, Pergamum was Washington, D.C. of Asia Minor. So this whole region, so the center of government was in Pergamum. It was also a religious center. So it had many just magnificent temples to pagan gods, to these Greek gods. It was also a cultural center because religion and culture were interwoven. And so it was a religion, but also a cultural center. There was a library there that had over 200,000, hear this, over 200,000 handwritten volumes. Second largest library of antiquity, second only to the biggest, of course, Alexandria was the biggest library. This was seconds only to that. Parchment was invented in Pergamum. And so this was a significant intellectual learning center, a cultural center. 
It was about 70 miles north of Pergamum. I'm sorry, of Smyrna, which we looked at last week. And it was about 1,300. So there's on the map, Pergamum on the very north. Patmos is where the apostle John was when he wrote these letters that Jesus gave to him. We saw Ephesus two weeks ago, Smyrna last week, and you go further up north and you hit Pergamum. And that's what we're looking at here today. It was elevated, not like Denver elevated, but about 1,300 feet above sea level, above the Caicos River Valley. And at the top of that, they had built a citadel or an acropolis that is basically just a fortified area with like huge towers, and that was just part of the Greek architecture. And there's ruins, they're still there, so you can go and you can see the ruins of, at the top of this, of this hill, this Acropolis. You can find not just those ruins, but you can find many other ruins, such as a, a theater. And if, if you look at this online, it's pretty amazing, actually. Like, they built this theater on the side of, like, a small mountain and 10,000 seats. And so with the incline, they put all the seats in it. And it's, to this day, the steepest theater in Turkey. It's still there. It's pretty remarkable. And so they had all these shows and entertainment that was right there in Pergamum. There were many temples um, uh, to the Emperor Trajan, one of the Caesars, the, uh, a throne to Zeus, and many other altars to other Greek gods. It's just scattered across. And again, the ruins are all still there that you can see them today. They even had a hospital. They didn't call it a hospital. It was called the Asclepium. You're like, well, why is it called that? Because the Greek god Asclepius was a snake god of healing. And so it was a large, like, hospital complex. But don't think like Scott and White, okay? Not like that. This was, this was a shrine. It was like a temple to the god of healing, Asclepius. And his symbol was a snake because he is the snake god, but of healing, which is why to this day, the symbol for the medical field is a staff with a snake around it. It's the staff of Asclepius. And so that's just why. And so there's a lot of Greek culture that still exists today. And if you don't think so, go to Washington, D.C. Like, just go to D.C. and go into Capitol Hill. Go to the Library of Congress. Just see the museums, the monuments. It, and, then, and then go to, if you have the resources, and then go to Turkey and go, or, or go to Athens and see all the ruins, and guess what you're going to see? The exact same architecture. It's very Greco. So our, our culture is built on the Greco-Roman culture. And so this hospital, this shrine to Asclepius, the way it would work is, is of course, run by priests in this temple. And if you were sick or injured and, and you needed to get medical attention, you would go to the Asclepium. And, and then they would see if they wanted to treat you. And if, and if the priests felt fairly confident that they could heal you, heal you, they'd let you in. If they felt like you were a liability and they, and they probably couldn't heal you, they would say, sorry, there's a door, and they would just give you the boot. Like, they, they wouldn't treat you. Like, they, they didn't want their God to be tainted with someone that was, like, for real sick and that couldn't come, come out healed by their false God. So if, if the priest said, yes, you're worthy of being healed by Asclepius, then they would let you in and go into this tunnel. It was just a massive area, this complex where they would treat you with their, I don't have time on the details, there's too, too much material, but you can Google if you want more information of how they would treat people. And then at the end, if, if, if the person was healed, then they would bow before this snake god, Asclepius, and kneel and praise him and worship him and, and thank him, this god, for their healing. And then what, what they would do before they left is there was these large white stones. And they would like inscribe on these stones the, the person's name that was healed and what they were cured of. So to give glory to Asclepius was, here's this person who was healed of whatever sickness. And then and this was massive stones. And again, if you go there today, the ruins are still there of this hospital. And you can see these large white stones that still have the inscriptions on them um, of people's names that were healed and what they were healed of, supposedly, by this snake god of healing. 
So there's a lot more to be said. There's so, so many archaeological finds and so many ruins in Pergamum. I could take a long time talking about that, but I just want to give you the context. I don't want to spend more time on that so you can look at the actual Bible. That's just the context. So the church of Pergamum that was in this context, we don't actually know who started it. So we don't, we don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us. So Acts doesn't record when the church of Pergamum was planted. But, but my guess would be, if you look at Acts 19, specifically verse 10, it describes an outreach in Asia Minor. And so likely Acts 19 is when this church and others were planted. And, but what's important isn't when the church was started or who started it. What's important is the message that resurrected Jesus has for the church of Pergamum. And then, because it's for all of God's churches, it includes this one. And this is a message for Renewal Church. And so let's, let's jump in with Revelation 2, verse 12, in this letter to the church of Pergamum. And to the angel of the church in Pergamum write, the words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword. We'll just start there with that intro. So again, this is a letter revealed by Jesus to John given to the divine messenger, this angel who is watching over this church. And this is a fully glorified, resurrected Jesus who is radiant that we already saw in chapter 1. And if you missed that, you may want to go back on our website and watch or listen to that because it just shows the absolute stunning glory of Jesus. And here we see this same Jesus who is in full glory, resurrected, is speaking. And the same language from chapter 1 on having this two-edged sword coming out of his mouth. And so before Jesus gives them the message, he wants them to know who he is and what he is about so that they know who is speaking to them because it matters, right? Like if you get a letter and and and, and it says IRS on the front, you're like, no, I don't even want to open that. Like, I don't even, why are they writing to me? I don't want to hear from them. This is like for real. Like, I don't want to hear from the IRS. It's never good news. Like, it's always bad. And, but if it's from your wife or parents or loved one, like, oh, like, I want to read that. Like, it depends on who it's from. So who is addressing you matters. So we see here that He's saying, this is me, I am Jesus, and I have this double-edged sword, which was more like a spear-like sword in the ancient world, and it was a symbol of authority, also of judgment, but specifically in this context here, as we begin, he, he wants us to know, this is me, I am Jesus, I have this sword, I have judgment, I have the authority, and this matters because because I, I know this as a father. I have four kids, and I have two that are older, middle and high school, and two that are in first grade. And I'll have my two little ones that can be down the street hanging out with friends or in the backyard or somewhere, and I might be busy and say, hey, hey, older sibling, can you please go get your younger siblings? And they'll go outside and say, hey, time to come inside. And then, I mean, I can hear it. No, I don't want to. I'm still playing or something along those lines, usually not respectful at all. Um, and of course, all of a sudden comes in and says, Dad, he won't come in. And I'm like, well, you forgot to say the magic words. And it's not please. It's not please. The, the words are, Dad said so. Because if you add those three words, now when the messenger, the older sibling, comes to the younger sibling and says, time to come inside, Dad said so. Now, what's the difference? There's authority. There is weight. And it's no longer the sibling who is speaking. It is the father who is speaking through the mouthpiece of that sibling saying, I am here on behalf of our father. I beseech thee to obey. There's great prudence and coming forth into thy house. Or suffer consequences. Like, this is a real thing. So now what happens if an older sibling says, dad said so, and dad actually didn't say so? 
See, now, now what you have is an abuse of power that was not yours. And so there are way too many messengers that say, Thus saith the Lord, and the Lord then saith. And so if you're going to speak for Jesus, and by the way, this is a weighty thing. Like, I just want you to be aware of this. I, I do not take the proclamation of God's word lightly whatsoever. Because, I mean, I, I can read it, and that's, that's enough. It's God who speaks with it being read. Anything that I or anyone else would say is commentary. That's all it is. It's commentary on the Word. And so if someone is going to comment on the Bible, it better be what the Bible, who God himself is wanting to say to his people. So I am just a messenger. Just like John was just a messenger, like my older sibling or son or daughter can be the messenger to the younger sibling on heed, obey father's instruction. But we as a church need to heed our father's instruction. And this message given to us in these pages of scripture come with the authority of resurrected Jesus, and it says, because Jesus said so. It's like, oh, yeah, that kind of changes everything, doesn't it? Because it's Jesus who is speaking. There is authority, and he's one holding this sword. And so our, our purpose here is to listen and respond to what believers do. We want to hear the voice of the good shepherd calling the sheep. And so I pray, and I honestly do pray this regularly, is that whenever you hear me preach, I pray that in your heart that you would be hearing the voice of your master, hearing the voice of Jesus calling to you to come. And that you would not hear my South Texas accents, but that you would hear Jesus. And what he tells his church is to listen to this message. And, and he's describing and how to be a radiant church, how to be vibrant. And he gives a lot, but I'm going to distill it down to just three characteristics of a vibrant church. And so in, in the text, we look at three characteristics of a vibrant church that radiates God's glory. Number one, a vibrant church is relentless. No relenting no giving in, unyielding, not distracted by this world, our eyes on the prize, focused, relentless. A healthy, vibrant church is relentless. You see it in verse 13 as we continue. I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. Man, that's intense, right? I know where you live. Where Satan's throne is, yet you hold fast my name and did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. He says it again. Satan lives in Pergamum. His throne is in Pergamum. Remember why? This was a center of religion, a center of Roman rule. And so Satan was using this world structure of the Greek gods, these pagan gods, all of these temples, all of this Roman authority. And Jesus says, yes, when you look out, you see shrines and temples. And yes, that's what you see. But it's Satan behind the scenes who is actually ruling and has his throne, his center of power. So it's, it seems from the text that Satan had a satanic stronghold in Pergamum. It was a place of darkness, and it was intense. And the people of the day didn't even know. They were worshiping Satan. They were worshiping Apollo and Zeus and Artemis and Asclepius. They were worshiping these other gods, but in actuality, it was Satan. Because that's the power behind these false gods. They worshipped in Pergamum, for example, Dionysus, who was the god of wine. We talked about him last week. 
the God of pleasure and of enjoyment. They also worship the God Demeter, who was the goddess of grain, who they would look to and trust and hope in to have a good harvest, to have financial prosperity. And so for their, their sustenance, they were looking to Demeter to provide for their physical needs. They looked to the Roman emperor because they worshipped the Caesar for safety and for security. They looked to Asclepius, the snake god, for healing. And so they had their needs, and then they would look to one of these gods to provide for them. But in their day, they were just going about their lives, just doing their thing, living in their culture, being swept by what was normal just in their cultural context. But they did not even realize that behind all of that was a very dark, evil spirit named Satan, who lived there, had a stronghold there, and had everyone deceived, and that Asclepius, the snake god, behind him was the serpent of old, who has been deceiving the people of God from the beginning of creation. And Satan wanted to deceive them and us today the same way, making people think that we have to look to this world and the things in our own efforts in order to find joy and purpose. That everything that we need for life, that we can find it with what we can accomplish with our own hands and what this world has to offer. And Satan is still deceiving people because Satan is keeping the spirit of Dionysus alive today because we have a world that is obsessed with pleasure. The spirit of Demeter is alive and well today where we look to our 401ks and we look to the stock market and our business to provide for ourselves and and then we find our hope and our purpose and our status and our significance and what we can accomplish to provide for ourselves. It's the same spirit that is at work today in the sons of disobedience. The prince of power of the air. Satan is very much at work in deceiving people and thinking, you got this. You got this. No, we don't got this. These are all distractions. We can lose focus. And forget that God's on his throne and that we are dependent on God and lose our rightful place as worshipers, dependent on God, and that we're we're not self-sufficient Only God is, that we need him and we need each other. We can't look to this world for hope. We must be steadfast. Like he tells them that you've held fast to my name and you have not given in even when one of your brothers, Antipas, was being killed. The word Antipas means to stand against. And so it's saying you're standing against you're being relentless. You're, you're, not, you're not caving. You, you have not refused to dishonor. Like, so you haven't dishonored my name. And so they've refused to dishonor the name of Jesus. And so you see them relentlessly holding fast to Jesus, even when Satan is bringing it. But unfortunately, they were not relentless holistically. In some ways they were, but as a whole, they were not. Because in verse 14, Jesus has some concerns for them but I have a few things against you. Thinking, oh man, yes. You're doing a good job in this area. You are holding fast to my name. You're not not giving in to the culture as a whole. But verse 14, but I have a few things against you. You have some, so not everyone, but in the church, there are some there who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so that they might eat food sacrificed to idols and practice sexual immorality. And then verse 15. So also you have some who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. So let me give you some context in these names like Nicolaitans, Balaam, Balak. Like who, who are these people? Well, Numbers 22, Old Testament. When Israel had left Egypt in the wilderness and before they went to the promised land. So this is in in that era when Moses was still leading God's people. 
okay? What you had was the king of Moab, Balak, who's mentioned here, hired a rent a prophet. He hired Balaam. He's the guy that the donkey talked to him. Remember that story? That's the same guy, Balaam. He was a pagan. He was not a good person. He did not love God. He did not worship God. He was rented by an evil king, Balak. So Balaam was to go and curse God's people. So he was hired, so paid money. Like this is his job. He got hired to go and curse the people of God. Now, if you keep reading in the story, it's really kind of humorous because every single time that Balaam gets up with, you know, in this spiritual experience of his, he's trying to curse and only blessings come out. So every single time, like, he opens his mouth to speak curses and blessings of Jesus and Messiah, like, just pour out. And, and so Balak says, hey, what gives? Like, I'm paying you, bro. Like, I'm paying you to curse them, to destroy them, and you're just pronouncing blessings on them. And he was like, I'm so, I'm trying. That's just what's coming out. Like, it's, God's going to bless them. Sorry. Like, deal, Moab. Like, God's with them. Like, but then if you keep reading, you get to, to Numbers 31, verses 15 and 16. Just two verses, but really important. It shows us that, that Balaam realized, I am trying to attack God's people straight ahead, straight on. And it's not working because the blessings are pouring. So Balaam then gives Balak a great idea. Hey, let's go in from the back door where they're not going to notice us coming. Let's get them to compromise. Let's seduce these men with our, our really hot women. And let's get them to intermarry. And let's seduce them with this erotic Canaanite pagan religion. They'll love it. They'll eat it up. And then what will happen is they will rot from the inside. Because these men won't be following God. They're going to be chasing these women. And it says following sexual immorality, adopting the gods of the Canaanites and eating meat sacrificed to idols, worshiping idols. And so since we can't, we can't attack them straight on, let's get them to compromise. And that's what you see in the church of Pergamum. This is a compromised church. You see it in verse 15. Also, you have some whole teaching of the Nicolaitans. Now, we don't know exactly who this Nicholas was, but... It seems from early church writings that he is the Nicholas from Acts chapter 6. If you go to Acts 6 verse 5, it describes these original seven deacons that were called to serve the church in the leadership role. Um, there were some great men like Philip to name one, but Nicholas was one of these seven men, and apparently he lost his way because sometimes we know church leaders do lose their way. And he adopted heresy, and he began to teach this teaching that was then known as the Nicolaitans because he was a prominent church leader, and a celebrity in the first century church, like one of these seven men. Like he was, he, was, he was a big deal, and so people following him got to his head. I don't know the whole story. We don't know, but we do know that he was teaching false things. And according to what we see here in Revelation 2, he was teaching them to indulge like Balaam did, in sexual immorality and then eating meat sacrificed to idols. So he was teaching this false gospel that said, hey, it's okay, just go for it. If you want it, just go do it. Just go enjoy life. God wants you to be happy, go be happy. Just do whatever it is that you want to go do. And, and so this false teaching led to great corruption and it made the church compromise and no longer be set apart and holy. And so you see in this text two types of compromises, and, and they flow from each other. The first one is it was biblical compromise. So they were compromising, it says, the teaching. So they were, they were believing false teaching. And so when you begin to compromise on the Bible, so biblical compromise, 
when you have a low view of Scripture and you water down the gospel, then what's going to happen is you're going to then secondly compromise morally. It's a natural progression. You start with compromising biblical, theological truth. It's only a matter of time before that church begins to look like the world. No longer holy, no longer set apart. So a high view of Scripture is one where we affirm the inspiration of Scripture. We affirm the inerrancy of Scripture, the infallibility of Scripture, so inspired by God and with no errors. We also affirm the authority, the clarity, the necessity, the sufficiency of Scripture. This could be a long sermon, but I'll just leave it at that. You can look it up later if you want. High view of Scripture, all of these different terms, they mean something. It means that here as a church that we believe the Bible and that we will treasure the Bible. We will preach from the Bible. And if you ever hear me or anyone else in here or home group or Bible study begin to do teaching that is not biblical or you hear sermons that are not in the Bible, then you have, if you're a member, you have a voice And you better use it because we need to be a church that does not compromise on the Bible, does not compromise biblical, theological, sound doctrine. Because if we do, then we are going to begin to compromise with our lifestyle, our morals. We'll we'll begin to say, well, we need to soften the edges of the gospel because then we're going to offend people. And we don't, we don't want people to be offended. Like, we, we need to fill the room, and we need to get, uh, you know, be a mega church. And so let's go ahead and soften the edges so that we can get as big as we can possibly become. And you see this across the American church landscape. They stop being relentless. They compromise. And let me give you another way that church can compromise that flows from this, too. It's called Pragmatism. Many churches are very pragmatic in how they operate. I'm telling you this right now. There is exactly nothing about what we do of any significance that is pragmatic. Maybe the breakfast that we get to serve our setup team, that maybe is pragmatic, like, like what makes sense and what's you know, low cost for breakfast. But other than that, like, we don't make any decisions that are pragmatic. Everything that we do, what we sing, how we do it, what we preach, how we operate, our home groups, our partnerships, everything, everything about everything that we do as a church has to be intentional and biblical, not pragmatic, not, well, what works, or, well, well if it makes sense, then just do it. And so if we're not going to compromise biblical truth because something works so that we can then have ministry success. That's not the goal. The goal is not success. The goal is faithfulness to the Bible. And if if we're faithful to the Bible, then I believe God will give us success as he defines success. Because honestly, what is success? I'll give you one way that I think of success is whenever I die and I'm resurrected and I stand before Jesus, he says, well done, good and faithful servant. That's a success. They're, they're, God's approval is success, not man's approval. So we don't ever emphasize talent over character. We don't. We emphasize character first and foremost. We don't compromise our vision for ministry results. These are just examples. And so we're, we're not going to let pragmatism to define what we do It's our values from the Bible that define what we are and what we do as a church. We want to be relentless, unyielding in the face of our culture. Number two, a church that's vibrant is repentant. So we are relentless and we're repentant. Verse 16, therefore repent. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. So he's saying it's not the whole church, but there's enough in the church and you're compromising. 
And so you need to repent or I'm going to war the same sword of judgment and my authority. I'm going to use that against the people in this church that are compromising and that are preventing the church from being successful, from being able to accomplish the vision, from being a vibrant church that's radiating God's glory. So I'm going to war against them. Like that's big time to hear that. Like I don't want Jesus to bring his sword against me. But here's why. Why he would do that. It's because he loves us. And if we lose our way, he wants to bring us back where we belong, which is with him in his presence. And repentance means to turn around and go opposite direction. So repent means to turn and go back, return back to your first love. Return to Jesus. You know, the word Pergamum is actually a combination of two Greek words, and combines those two words actually mean marriage. And it's interesting that, that the church of marriage, because this church was compromised, and so it was as though he was saying, you're married to me because the whole point of marriage is just a picture of Christ's love for the church, and so we are spiritually married to Jesus, but they were married to the world. It's like they were in bed with the world. They were believing the lies. And so I pray that, we're, that we'll be a church, that we're repentant, that we are quick to repent and quick to turn back to Jesus, a church where it's normal. Like it's just normal for people to get together and say, hey, how are you doing? And then you say, man, I'm struggling. Where being real with each other is normal. Where being honest and repenting becomes a part of our regular rhythm of how we share our lives, where we speak truth and love and then we receive it and we quickly repent. And we all need each other because the truth is that enemy has subtle lies and we can all believe them. These lies that are subtle that we believe of, well, God understands. Does he really? Or the lie of, well, this sin is going to bring me happiness or comfort. Like we actually think this time when I do it, it's going to feel really good. And then, of course, it leaves you empty like it is every single time. Or, or the lie of, well, I don't have to tell anyone. I, I can keep this one to myself and keep this in private. Or we believe the lie of, I'll quit soon. Really? Will you Really? And if you're going to quit soon, you think you'll do it by yourself privately? No, you won't. You can't. It's bigger than you. You can't. You need your brothers and sisters. Or the lie that we believe, I've got it under control. I've got this. Really? I think maybe it's got you. Or, or we believe the lie of, man, but I'm just in a unique situation. Like, you know, like, I know what the Bible says, but I have a particular set of unique circumstances, and that's why I'm doing this. And it's like, no, you're not above what the Bible says. We're all under God's authority. So I'm just saying there's so many more examples, but there's different lies that we can believe that are subtle that we need to be able to identify them and have brothers and sisters that will love us. And together, we can be a church that is repentant and that is vibrant. And so a vibrant church is one that is relentless and that is repentant. Number three, last is responsive, responsive to God, that responds to God. Verse 17, finish the letter. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one except the one who receives it. Man, that's amazing. Um. Jesus calls the church to respond. He says, hear, hey, listen, hear me, hear this. He says, respond to what I'm telling you. Like, he wants the church to be responsive because really the essence of worship is to respond to what God has revealed about himself and redemption through Christ. And then he offers three blessings. Now, my, my time is so brief, but there's three blessings here. He says, one hidden manna. He will give those who conquer hidden manna. 
No longer hidden, it's revealed, it's exposed. Here it is, he's going to show us his manna. Now, this is juxtaposed because early talked about idolatry, and eating meat, sacrifice to idols. So eating the food of the world is like, I give you my food. I will satisfy you. I mean, Jesus himself said that he is the bread of life, manna who came down from heaven. And so Jesus satisfies us. And one day in this messianic banquet, when we're resurrected, then we will enjoy this manna in the presence of Jesus, who alone can satisfy our deepest hunger. So we receive this hidden manna. Second, he says, I'll give you a white stone. Now, honestly, I don't know what that is. Because I don't know which one. There's like 10 options. Like there's so many possibilities. And I believe that that Jesus mentioned the white stone and left it kind of ambiguous or vague on purpose because all the various options have a similar theme that runs through all of them. And the theme is intimacy. So this white stone is about intimacy. You're like, what? How does a white stone point to intimacy? Well, let me give you three of the primary possibilities or likelihood of what this means. One is in, in the Greco world, when, whenever there was a court case and there were jury members, well, they were given two stones, a black and a white stone. And if, and if that jury member thought, well, this person is guilty, they would, they would present the black stone. If they felt, no, this person is innocent, so acquittal, they present the white stone. So it's quite possible Jesus was referring to here on this white stone of declaring us innocent, acquitted, because Jesus died on the cross, took our sin, the atoning work of Christ, the sacrificial work of Christ, and then he resurrected, defeated sin, offers us forgiveness if we will trust in him. And he says, if you will trust in my work on the cross, then I will give you this white stone to say not guilty and enter in to my kingdom. But it could also be no one. You see, also in the Greek world, whenever people would, would race and have athletic competitions because Greeks loved like Olympics and athletics, when, whenever they would win, of course, they would get the crown, you know, the wreath, and so this victor's crown, but they would also receive a white stone that was basically a ticket to enter into a feast later that day in their honor of, of having won in that competition. And so it could be that Jesus is saying, I'm going to give you those who conquer, he says. I'm going to give you this white stone that says, here, now you can enter in to my banquet, this messianic banquet at the end, which, again, it means closeness with Jesus. But another option, we talked earlier about this, is with this snake god healing. People would inscribe their names on this white stone. And Jesus here says that he's going to inscribe your new name on a white stone. He began a letter saying, you have not forsaken my name. You've held fast to my name. I'm going to give you a new name. And I'm going to inscribe it on this stone because I've healed you. I've crushed the serpent And here is a special name just between you and me. No one else knows this name. And it's on this stone. This is yours. Enter in to my kingdom. Come to the banquet. Come eat with me. Come enjoy me. I will satisfy you. Like nothing else in this world May this define who this church is. May it be a vibrant church that looks to Jesus and is relentless in our pursuits of him, that is quick to repent, and that is responsive to our God. May we be steadfast and have hearts that burn for Jesus. Jesus.